So hello and welcome to this NPTEL course entitled um, Feminist Writings, where we'll begin with a short story today. Uh, it's called The Fly by Catherine Mansfield. We have just finished covering uh, Donna Haraway's essay um, in a book, The Cyborg Manifesto, prior to which we covered Bell Hooks' essay, Understanding Patriarchy. Uh, so those were uh, works in nonfiction. So this particular uh, text that we'll start with today is obviously a work of fiction. And in this course, as you know by now, is a combination of fictional text and non-fictional uh, texts like essays and uh, political writings. So the reason why this short story is important is because it's a very strong feminist critique of patriarchy, a very strong feminist critique of a certain kind of patriarchy which is violent, which is uh, unemotional, which places a very high value on you know, masculinity, you know, muscular masculinity, brave masculinity, a plucky masculinity. Uh, so it has a certain code of conduct for men, a certain code of conduct for women. And what's interesting is that how this essay deconstructs that stereotypical understanding of uh, masculinity and femininity. And in a way, it's very uh, dialogic with the Bell Hooks essay, Understanding Patriarchy, because you know, if you remember that essay where Hooks is very clearly saying that patriarchy is not just a construct, it's almost a pathological construct, it's almost a disease which affects men and women because everyone's consumed and affected by that disease. Everyone's expected to perform a certain kind of narrative through embodied practices, through language, through rituals, through social norms, etc. And that becomes a, a form of closure, which you know, most often than not, uh, we, we can't deconstruct, we can't come out of. Now, what this story does is that it gives you a, a seemingly strong man, someone who's seemingly strong, someone who's seemingly superior, seemingly bossy. So we have the figure called the boss, whose name we don't know. We never, it's never revealed what his real name is. So you have this figure of boss, who is the protagonist of, the, of this particular short story. Uh, and the setting of the story is important. The setting is First World War. So it's immediately after the First World War. And uh, it's giving you a very interesting demography uh, after the First World War, as will be unfolded when we read the story. But it's important that when we read uh, a writer like Mansfield, that language is a very important thing because you know it's a very coded kind of language that she is using, and symbols become very important. Uh, you know, metaphors become very important because if you read the story, uh, as we will in a moment, we find it's a really short story. It's one of the shortest stories ever written, perhaps in English literature. But what's interesting is how much she packs into the story in terms of content, in terms of cultural contact, uh, content, and how she connects to a broader, wider narrative of the war. Uh, the destruction of the war, the, the violence of the war, etc., uh, which is all there uh, without being spoken about directly, right? So this indirect discourse of representation becomes a very important a form of narrative strategy in this story. So let's start, let's dive into the story and see how it unfolds before us in terms of a very powerful feminist text. So this is Catherine Mansfield's short story, The Fly. You've read snug in here, piped old Mr. Woodyfield, and peered out of the great green leather armchair by his friend, the boss's desk, as a baby peers out of his pram. So the very opening sentence is uh, full of metaphors, full of similes, full of figurative expressions, which are obviously conveying you something without telling you directly. So we have this figure called old Mr. Woodyfield. So that, that adjective old comes before his name all the time, almost all the time. And uh, he's sitting in a great green leather armchair, right, uh, by his friend the boss's desk. So the boss is sitting on a desk and Woodyfield, who's very old, is sitting in a great green leather armchair by the desk of the boss. And interestingly, uh, he's looking at the boss in a way as a baby peers out of his pram. So this baby metaphor is interesting. This baby over here is not suggestive of uh, innocence, it's not suggestive of beauty, it's not suggestive of hope or optimism. It's suggestive of helplessness uh, in a sense because the baby quality over here is uh, equated with the senility of Woodyfield. He's a senile character. And the senility is Describe in metaphors which are infantilized. I mean, the, you know, Woodyfield is infantilized throughout the story. Uh, he's constantly compared to a baby. He's constantly compared to a helpless person, someone who doesn't have any agency. And a question of agency will come back later, and we'll discuss and unpack how agency is described and dramatized in the story. But for the moment, let's pay attention to the opening sentence, because as I mentioned, when you're dealing with a writer like Mansfield, uh, language becomes very important, expressions, uh, the economy of expressions becomes very important. It's very economical, but at the same time, it's quite packed in in terms of content. 
So he is looking at the boss uh, with envious eyes and as a baby peels out of his pram, as uh, from a pram later. His talk was over. It was time for him to be off, but he did not want to go. Since he had retired since his stroke, he, the wife and the girls kept him boxed up in the house every day of the week except Tuesday. So again, if you look at the verbs over here, which are important, so we get to know that Willifield has had a stroke. Willifield has retired. Uh, now he's obviously come to visit his boss. Uh, it could have been his boss. It could have been his friend who is the boss. We don't quite know. But we get to know that he, uh, he gets locked up in the house, boxed up in the house. Now, you know, his, the wife and the girls keep kept him boxed up in the house. Now, this is interesting because if you look at the gender dynamics at play over here, we have Woodyfield who's obviously a man. He's an old man. He's a senile man. He's an infantilized man but who really doesn't have or doesn't seem to have, doesn't appear to have much of an agency because even his movement, his mobility is controlled and dominated by his uh, wife and the girls. And it's interesting we have uh, the presence of female characters over here. There's no mention of any son as yet. The wife and the girls kept him boxed up in the house, locked in the house, confined in the house uh, essentially every day of the week except Tuesday. So Tuesday is the only day of the week in which he was allowed to go and visit uh, his friends. But apart from that, he was essentially locked up in his house by his wife and the girls, the daughters. On Tuesday, he was dressed and brushed and allowed to cut back to the city for the day. So again, if you look at the verbs away, they're telling you a lot uh, without really spelling out for you. He was dressed and brushed and allowed. Right? So again, we have this entire idea of agency, you know, uh, which doesn't really belong to Woodfield, apparently. So he was dressed up by the girls, just brushed by the girls and then he was allowed by the girls to go to the city. So uh, the metaphors are very, very uh, you know, childlike metaphors, childish metaphors, babyish metaphors. So the sense of this connection with the baby keeps happening throughout the, the story. Woody Field keeps getting connected, keeps getting equated uh, with a baby figure, essentially, in the story. So you know, he was allowed, he was addressed, he was brushed, like a baby would be brushed. Though what he did there, the wife and the girls couldn't imagine. So it was you know, unimaginable for the girls and the wife to, to to even think of what he must have done, what he must be doing in the city. Made a nuisance of himself to his friends, they supposed. Well, perhaps so. All the same, we cling on, we cling to our last pleasures as a tree clings to its last leaves. So again, this idea of decadence is important over here. The tree, we have this image of a tree losing its leaves, uh, which is compared to Woodyfield, uh, Woodyfield's condition. So, uh, you know, we cling to our last pleasures as a tree clings to its last leaves. So the, the arrival of winter, the arrival of death, which is symbolized um, metaphorically by winter on many occasions. So that is being compared to Woodyfield. So immediately in the story we have Woodyfield being compared uh, with infantilized metaphors, with you know, decadent metaphors, or metaphors of decadence, metaphors of infantilization, etc. Uh, this comparison, this tree image becomes important, the tree losing its leaves, uh, clinging on desperately to its last leaves. Um, and the equation over here is Woodyfield desperately clinging on to his last bits of pleasure. Uh, you know, which includes coming and seeing his old friend, the boss. So there sat old Woodfield smoking a cigar and staring almost greedily at the boss, who rolled in his office chair, stout, rosy, five years older than him, still going strong and still at the helm. It did one good to see him. So if you look at, again, the, uh, the entire gaze away, uh, the gaze becomes important because Woodfield is sitting on his chair smoking a cigar and staring almost greedily at the boss. So, you know, he's greedy, uh, he's envious, uh, he's jealous of the boss. And now we get to know that the boss, if you compare and contrast the boss's uh, body over here, the way it's described, the embodiment of the boss. And embodiment is a very crucial thing uh, in gender, as we know. Uh, and I'll talk about embodiment in more details later. But what is being essentially told to us is the boss is rolling in his office chair, stout, rosy, five years older than him, he. So his stout uh, is still very rosy, he's very healthy, and we are also told that he's five years older than Woodyfield, which is obviously, uh, it, it's, uh, you know, it, it's reflective of the fact that boss is taking care of himself in a much better way than Woodyfield has done. I mean, despite being biologically older than Woodyfield by five years, the boss appears much more in control, much more stout, much more healthy, much more rosy in quality. Still going strong, still at the helm, still in control, still going strong, still healthy. It did one good to see him. So what he feel, feels a um, uh, sense of insp inspiration, sense of uh, uh, you know being invigorated, or revigorated, looking at the boss, uh, or rejuvenated, looking at the boss, because you know he he, he stares at the boss greedily, but at the same time uh, admiringly. So there's a degree of admiration and envy mixed together in Woodyfield's gaze at the boss. 
wistfully, admiringly, the old voice added. Again, note the word old, which keeps coming back, uh, keeps associating itself with Woodyfield. The old voice added, it's noggin here upon my word. It's comfortable in here upon my word. You, you've got a good office over here. You've got a comfortable setting over here. It's noggin here upon my word. Yes, it's comfortable enough, agreed the boss. And I flipped the Financial Times with a paper knife. Now, if you just look at this one sentence, it's packed with uh, very meaningful suggestions over here. Now, Winifield is using the word snug, which is a colloquial word for comfort. And the boss is obviously being more uh, formal, is comfortable enough. And that, that's a very formal way of expressing uh, his situation. And that obviously goes to show that the boss is more formal in his language, the boss is more you know, imperious. Uh, in his activities, in his embodiment, because language becomes very much a part of embodiment. How you speak, what you say, the content of your language becomes, it represents you as a person, it represents your body, yourself as a person. So if you're using very imperious words, you know, like comfortable enough, uh, imperious expressions, that goes to show that your embodiment is uh, quite imperious and quite uh, strong at the same time. So, and I flip the Financial Times with a paper knife. Now, again, if you look at the metaphors, the, the symbols used over here, Financial Times is very much a business newspaper. So the boss is reading or about to read uh, a business newspaper and he flips it open with a paper knife. Uh, and this movement of flipping open a paper with a paper knife uh, is a movement of vigor, a movement of activity, a movement of agency. So the boss is about to read a business newspaper, having opened it with one, at one girl with a paper knife. That, that goes to show, that becomes an indicator uh, to a certain extent, uh, of his masculinity, an enactment of his masculinity. Uh, you know, the, the codes of masculinity are creeping in uh, very, very strongly already. As a matter of fact, he was proud of his room. He liked to have it admired, especially by old Woodyfield. It gave him uh, a feeling of deep, solid satisfaction to be planted there in the midst of it in full view of that frail old figure in the muffler. And so, this. Uh, and I mentioned already how gaze is a very important thing. The way the stares are happening, the way people are looking at each other becomes very important. It gives you, um, you know, it gives you an idea of privilege and lack of privilege over here. So the boss over here obviously uh, enjoys privilege. He's occupying a position of privilege. And he was proud of his room. He wanted to have it admired. He liked to have it admired, especially by old Woodyfield. And that gave him a sense of superiority. You know? So he feels superior compared to Woodyfield. He was obviously senile and infantilized and quite weak and agency-less in, in comparison to the boss. Now, it gave him a feeling of deep, solid satisfaction. And again, the, the solidity of the satisfaction is important over here. It's almost like a material thing, satisfaction. It's almost like a thing, a tangible thing. Uh, it's not something uh, which is abstract uh, at the level of feelings only. It's something which can, is palpable uh, in its quality, almost material, almost fleshy in its quality. Now, he's very satisfied to be planted in, a full, in the midst of it, in full view of the frail old figure in the muffler. That's how Woodyfield is described, frail old figure in the muffler. Uh, and that description obviously is a very uh, negative description. Uh, he's frail, he's old, he's uh, you know, muffled up in, in pieces of cloth. He's not really a human being. There's a degree of mummification which is uh, suggested over here. Woodyfield appears more as a mummy rather than as a human being. He's completely covered with muffler, he's frail and he's old compared to the stout rosy boss who is uh, five years older than him and still despite the biological age of the boss he's obviously much more in control of his life and of his activities. I've had it done up lately, he explained, as explained for the past how many weeks. So he's now about to show off his office and he declares that he has repaired it, has uh, renovated it, has, has done it up uh, recently. The new carpet and he pointed to the bright red carpet with a pattern of large white rings. New furniture, and in order to us, a massive bookcase with a table like with legs that twisted to trickle. Electric heating. He waved almost exultantly towards a fire of transparent pearly sausages glowing so softly in the tilted copper pan. So, you know, he's showing off his amenities, he's showing off his objects uh, to old Woodyfield. Now, this obviously becomes a very uh, male thing. So, we have two men sitting together. One uh, obviously stronger than the other, one in a more agentic position than the other, one in a more privileged position compared to the other. And a boss over here is showing off his objects and, and entire objects, entire list of amenities around him, that becomes an idea, that becomes a sense of a distributive embodiment. So his embodiment is more distributive in quality. He's showing off his, uh, you know, new carpet, uh, you know, new furniture, bookcase, electric heating, the sausages, you know, sausage-like uh, you know, heaters in his pan, etc. 
Uh, so all these become e examples or extensions of this embodiment, uh, strong, stout, rosy embodiment. Uh, compared and contrast to it, uh, Woody Field uh, appears much more senile and much more infantilized in quality. So at the very outset of the story, we have two different models of masculinity pitted against each other or juxtaposed with each other. So we have Woody Field who is senile, who is weak, who is helpless, uh, who is controlled and dominated by the woman in the house in a complete reversal of stereotypical uh, gender roles. He's allowed to go to the city only on a certain day of the week. He's dressed up, he's brushed by the woman. So he's uh, essentially a, a child, uh, you know, an infantilized figure who is dominated by the woman. Now, compared and contrast to which the boss is obviously bossy in quality. Uh, he's an imperious, uh, stout man, big, strong man, uh, who is very happy with the surroundings, apparently very happy with the surroundings, and he's quite content to show off uh, his objects. It's almost like showing off one's toys, uh, you know, newly acquired toys uh, as figures of embodiment and you know, as signifiers of embodiment, signifiers of prestigious embodiment. Right, so embodiment is a very crucial thing in the story and like I said, embodiment is not just about the body, it's about how you represent the self uh, through language, through objects, through acquisitions, through property, etc. So the boss obviously over here enjoys a, a higher form of embodiment, a higher order of embodiment than Woodyfield or compared to Woodyfield. So he, he's just showed off his, uh, you know, carpet and furniture and electric heating. And now comes an important section of the story. But he did not draw Woodyfield's attention or old Woodyfield's attention. That jet never leaves him, by the way. He did not draw old Woodyfield's attention to the photograph of the, of the table of a grave looking boy in uniform standing in one of those spectral photographer's parks with photographer storm clouds behind him. It was not new. It had been there for over six years. Now, this is an important, uh, you know, almost like an insertion uh, into the entire area of objects that the boss enjoys over here. So he's saying, you know, the, the narrative voice is telling us the boss is very happily showing off his objects, his trophies, his toys, as it were, to Woodyfield, but he did not draw attention, Woodyfield's attention, to a photograph on the table. Now, that photograph is that of a boy, a grave looking boy. Now, the word the adjective grave looking away, uh, it takes up uh, multiple meanings because we have this idea of spectral photograph of spark and a spectral ca carries a death like quality, a ghostly quality, a ghostly shadowy quality. So grave looking boy could mean uh, a serious looking boy which is a more literal meaning, a serious, grave as in serious, but it can also carry connotations of death, uh, of uh, degree of spectrality, shadowy deadly presence because you know the word spectral appears immediately after grave looking boy. One of the spectral photographer sparks with photographer storm clouds behind him. It was not new, it had been there for over six years. So we suddenly we have this description of a little photograph of a boy in uniform, so presumably soldier's uniform. Uh, and we are also told that it's not a new object in the boss's office. It happened there for over six years. So, you know, and then it's departed from. It's, you know, we don't get any more descriptions of it at this point. Now, it's a very interesting example uh, of narrative complexity because, you know, we have a certain kind of a linearity of narrative which is going. Uh, and we are having a certain kind of gendered identity of the, of the boss being fleshed out before us with his financial times, a uh, very phallic paper knife with which he opens or flings open uh, the financial times and then obviously the showing off different kinds of objects around him. And that is a continuation, a consolidation of his masculinity, of his dominant uh, muscular uh, masculinity and control of everything. Uh, hence the term boss fits in perfectly over here. But we certainly have a sense of uh, a superficial, at least superficially contrast, which comes in because you know the narrative voice tells us that he's showing off all these things, but it doesn't show off. Uh, we don't quite know why, of an old photograph, a six-year-old photograph, which had been in his office for quite a while, for over six years now, and the photograph is that of a grave-looking boy in uniform, a young man in uniform, standing in a very shadowy, almost death-like photograph of Spark. And we're not quite told. We don't know what is doing here, and then the narrative moves on uh, quickly from that point. And we just saw it was not new. It had been there for over six years. Okay, uh, and that's something that uh, a very important object which we'll come back to later in the story. But at this point, it just appears to be some kind of a narrative, um, you know, uh, interruption. Right? It's, it's, it was a continuation of narrative which was obviously designed to make the boss look more stout, more masculine, more dominant in quality and certainly we have a bit of a narrative interruption well, and we don't quite know what the interruption is doing over here. So we need to come back to the object later and the story obviously will come back to the object later and we'll find out 
later how that becomes the central object in the entire story and everything else, the electric heating, the furniture, you know, uh, the bookcase, those become secondary or peripheral in quality. So it's also important when you talk about gender, when you talk about gendered mappings or gendered embodiment, how does one navigate with the object? So a working definition of embodiment could be uh, your navigation with your surroundings, your representation of the self. So how do you represent and navigate at the same time? So embodiment has a neural quality, embodiment has an inner quality, a psychological quality. At the same time, embodiment has a material quality. How do you navigate with the apparatus around you? How do you control the apparatus around you, the objects around you, the things around you? So those become part of the embodiment as well. So there is this inside quality of embodiment as well as an extended quality of embodiment. Right? And that extended quality is something which we're seeing over here in terms of how the boss is throwing off uh, very proudly his office objects. Right? and how he's in, in a better control of his language, it's more imperious in quality, it's more formal in quality compared to Woodyfield. And Woodyfield comes as a very interesting counterpoint, a very convenient counterpoint uh, pitted against the boss in terms of you know, making the boss more, look more superior in terms of his masculinity. So we stop at this point today. We'll continue with this very complex short story in the lectures to come, but I do request you to read the entire story just so we can follow it more closely in the lectures, uh, in the coming lectures to come. Uh, so thank you for your attention.